Okay, now that you have a, a little more experience with how to find a uh, limit um, math or analytically by doing some algebra, we're gonna look at a special case uh, where a uh, limit is a little bit hard to find and what we're gonna do is try to kind of put it between functions that we know of so that we can find the actual limit. So for example, let's say that you have this function f and it is between h and z, g. So what does a function between two functions mean? Meaning, uh, you know, I kind of, I'll show you kind of later about it, but basically we're saying that the highest value that a function f can be is g, whatever that is, and then the lowest it could be is h. Um, so kind of just keep that in mind for now, I'll kind of show you what that means um, graphically. Okay, for all x not equal to c in some interval about c, then the limit as h go, uh, sorry, the limit as x goes to c of h equals a uh, limit as x goes to c of g. So if those two are equal and they're both equal to l, then by association, limit as x goes to c of the f function must equal L. And why is that? Because the F function is in between H and G. If both of them are going to L, then F being stuck between the two functions, it must also go to L, is what, it, what this theorem is saying. And this theorem is called the squeeze theorem or the sandwich theorem. Basically what we're saying with squeeze is that we're squeezing this function F between two functions h and g so that you know there are times where we cannot find the limit of f by itself so then we think of it as the extreme case okay the the highest number f can be is g function the smallest number f can be is the h function so now i have squeezed f between h and g and then by finding out the limit for h and g i can kind of by association figure out the limit of f and another way to say that is sandwich theorem because it kind of makes sense, right? It's you're kind of st sticking uh, the f function between like two pieces of bread or something like uh, g and h like that. So basically we call that a sandwich theorem because we're sandwich sandwiching f between two functions. Now, how does that actually play out? Um, so let's look at this example. So um, we're looking for the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times sine of 1 over 0. So remember, the first thing I said about finding limit is you plug it in. If you plug this in, you're going to get 0 times sine of 1 over 0. And we know that 1 over 0 is undefined, so technically we cannot fi figure out the limit. And you might want to say that this is um, does not exist, but uh, when we have something like this, where we have a zero times something that is one over zero inside another function, which is sine in this case. We don't want to make that kind of conclusion just because I can't solve it. I'm going to say um, uh, it doesn't exist. We want to try other methods to see if there is a limit because remember we said limit is not whether that number exists. We're saying where is y going when x is going closer and closer to zero. So maybe there is no number at zero, but the function is going to some kind of y value. Anyways, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to squeeze it um, between two functions. So what we're going to do now is uh, we are going to first split this function up. So I am going to only look at this part. So I am going to just look at the limit as x goes to zero of sine one over x. And why do I do that? I want to find something where I can find a limit. And then, you know, I'm, I'm going to kind of show you why I picked this. Uh, once I show you that there is a limit and then I'll show you why we didn't want to do this one instead. Okay, so sine of 1 over x. If you just think about the, the, the function sine of 1 over x, uh, you may, you probably wouldn't be able to know how it looks like. But let's just 
not think of it as 1 over x. Let's just think of it as sine x, sine something, sine something. So think about the function sine something. How does sine graph look like? Well, sine graph looks like this, right? Okay, and so what's going to affect the amplitude of the sine graph? The coefficient, right? So if there's a 2, then it goes up and down 2 and negative 2, like that. So essentially what happens is that we really don't care what's going on inside. It's as long as it's a variable inside, sine is eternally stuck between two numbers. And that has to do with the amplitude. Sine is eternally stuck between two y values. And those y values are 1 and negative 1, right? All sine functions has an amplitude, just a regular sine function, y equals sine x, is always going to be, since there's an uh, coefficient of 1, it's always going to be between negative 1 and 1. And so that is all sine function. When you change this x to 1 over x, it's still the same idea. You're still never going to escape the whole sine function itself. It's, it's stuck in the sine function. And so sine function dictate, dictates the whole uh, y value. So it's basically stuck between 0 and 1. And so then we can say that this sine 1 over x function is squeezed between two functions. This function that we didn't know what to do before, we call that f. It's actually stuck between two functions. This we call, what did I call that before? g. And then this is h. So you see how this is the squeeze, uh, squeeze theorem? We're squeezing f of x between h and g. And h being the lowest value that this function could be, which is negative 1. And then g being the highest value this function could be, which is 1. And now let's kind of think about it. Why didn't I choose x squared? x squared is an unbounded function. Remember, x squared looks like this. It's not stuck between two y values. There is a lowest point, but there is no highest point. So I cannot bound it. I cannot sandwich x squared between two numbers, and therefore it's, uh, it's impossible for us to apply the theorem. So that's why we don't use x squared. Um, okay, so we're at this point where we stuck sine 1 over x between negative 1 to 1, but that doesn't solve the problem. The, the problem has an x squared in this limit, in this function that we're trying to solve. So what do we do? Well, we're going to attach that x squared into this function. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this limit that we just found, uh, limit as x goes to 0 of sine 1 over x, and we're going to attach the limit x squared. Remember the limit law says if we have two functions multiplied together, we can split it as the limit of one times the limit of the other. And then so what we do to that, we do it to the two sides. So on this side, it was a one. So now I'm going to multiply by the limit of x goes to zero of x squared. And then on the left hand side, I had a negative one. And then I'm also going to multiply by that limit now what I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate the two ends. So remember, I'm still trying to squeeze this function between the two ends. So I want to solve the two ends to figure out what number it's being squeezed in between. Um, so on this side, we can see that a negative one we already know. So we're going to solve this limit. Limit as x goes to zero of x squared. Well, x squared is a continuous function. So if you put zero in there, you're going to get zero. So this whole thing becomes negative 1 times 0, and we know that is just 0. So the lowest end is a 0. In the middle, we don't know what it is. Um, I'm going to rewrite it so that the two functions multiply together, so it looks just like the problem. OK, now evaluate the right-hand side of the, the squeeze uh, theorem limit. On the right-hand side, 1 is just 1, so we're going to ignore that. Evaluate this limit. Limit as x goes to 0 of x squared, that is the same thing, and th that also gives us 0. So 1 times 0 is 0. Hey, two sides both go to 0. So then, if you have a function that is stuck between 0 and 0, then this function must also go to 0 by this squeeze theorem. So this limit that we couldn't find in the beginning, because if we plug it in, we're going to get 
um, something that we don't understand because it's uh, not uh, spelled out. So then we use the squeeze theorem to squeeze between two functions and then we kind of apply kind of build up the function so that we can get the original function back and then we realize that the two ends of this function actually goes to zero therefore this function the limit of this function must also go to zero okay <laughs> it's a lot of information so uh let's have let's try another one um this one is very easy because it's pretty much like the one i just showed you so i'm going to show you this one Okay, uh, same idea. Limit as x goes to 0 of x squared e to the sine of 1 over x. So again, ask yourself which function. So you can see that you can kind of think of it as many, many functions, right? So x squared, and then you have an e to the something function, and that something is a sine function of something inside. So you can kind of go crazy on that, but you want to pick something that actually is bounded between something. So you ask yourself, is x squared bounded? No, so don't pick that one. Is e to the x bounded? No, e to the x is an exponential function that goes up forever. Sine function, yep, it is bounded. What about this 1 over x? 1 over x is unbounded as well. So we have no choice but to choose sine 1 over x again as, our, um, as the function we're going to start with. Okay, so again, what we're going to do is write limit as x goes to 0. That's where we want to evaluate sine of 1 over x. And then we're trying to squeeze it between two functions. So again, you ask yourself, sine of 1 over x is stuck between which two values? And again, we remember that sine is between negative 1 and 1. Now what we're going to do is we're going to build it up until it looks just like the original function. So the next thing is we are going to raise this function to the, or by e. Okay, so I raised the original function by e. And so what I do here is I'm going to raise that right hand side by e as well and then left hand side as well. Okay, so I don't know what's going to happen in the middle, so I'm going to evaluate the two ends. Um, let's just write this again. Okay, e to the first is just e. And that ha like this whole function has no x, right? <laughs> so it doesn't really matter where x is going to. And then same thing here, limit uh, as x goes to 0 of e to the negative 1 is just 1 over e. All right, then we are going to apply this x squared. So multiply that limit. Um, I'm just going to put it together since it saves us one step. Okay, this one I'm going to write it separately. So limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times limit as x goes to 0 of e, which kind of makes no sense. I mean, e is just e. There is no x, so that is really just a constant e. Um, okay, same thing here. So limit as x goes to 0 of x squared times limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over e. All right, let's evaluate the two ends. Limit as x goes to 0 of x squared. We talked about this before. This is 0. And this part, we just said that 1 over e is just a constant that is not even a function. So this is just 0 times 1 over e, which is just 0. All right, less than or equal to limit as x goes to 0 of x squared e to the sine of 1 over x, less than or equal to. All right, so let's evaluate again. This part, again, goes to 0. This part is just e. So then we have a 0 times e, which is still 0. And so this function is again stuck between 0. Now you might ask me, are all these functions always going to 0? Not always, but uh, it's just that these problems are so similar that um, they end up kind of being the same. 
So again, just to review, the squeeze theorem is you start with a function that you can control be the, the two ends of this function. You're going to stuck kind of stuck it or stick it between two functions that are the higher end and the lower end of it. And then you kind of apply the, you know, whatever function you need to so that it gets to the original function. And then you, while you do that to the two ends. All right, now we're going to talk about trig limit. So trig limit looks a little bit crazy, but um, it's actually pretty easy. So once you figure out uh, the limit of one, you're going to uh, pretty much apply the trig rules to, um, to the limit to solve all kinds of different ones. All right, the first thing is, what is the limit as x goes to zero of sine x over x? Okay, so again, if you try to uh, uh, put zero in, you're going to get zero over zero, which, which re hopefully you remember is the indeterminate form. Indeterminate form. What does indeterminate form tell us? Tells us. It tells us that there may be a limit because usually when you have zero over zero, that means there is a hole. A hole that usually if you have a hole that tells us that there is a very high possibility that there is a limit. So then the, the question is, how do we find that limit? Well, we can't use algebraic way to find the limit uh, because there's nothing algebraically you can ma manipulate to find the limit. So this in this case, there is no other way except that we just use you know, a graphing calculator or something to figure out the limit. And so we check the calculator. It tells us that uh, both sides of zero are going to um, y equals one. So then this limit is one. And what you're going to do is memorize that. So the limit as x goes to zero of sine x over x is going to one. So memorize it as a fact. Um, because you don't want to try to solve it. You can try to solve it using squeeze theorem, but uh, it's not necessary. You can just solve it. I'm sorry, you can just memorize it. Okay, then what is the limit as x goes to zero of the reciprocal? This is also one. So again, just remember that as a fact. Okay, and also similarly, limit as x goes to zero of sine of any x over any x, meaning I can put that number as um, something like limit as x goes to zero of, let's say, sine 5x over 5x. And then also limit as x goes to zero of n x over sine n x so the reciprocal so same thing here limit as x goes to zero of 5x over sine 5x uh, this one is equal to one as well so anytime the nx and nx are the same you can assume that this whole thing also goes to one all right, let's try to solve the limit. So I'm going to show you a few and then you're going to solve the rest yourself. Okay, so first question. Limit as x goes to zero, please make sure you check. It is talking about x goes to zero. This method only applies to x going to zero. If x is not going to zero, like x is going to pi or x is going to infinity or anything else besides zero, you cannot apply this. So be please, please, please be careful. Okay. Um, of sine 4x over x. Well, we're a little bit stuck. What we learned is sine x over x or even sine nx over nx. We have a sine 4x, but we don't have a 4x here. So we can't cancel. Uh, so, or we can't just say that it's the same. So what should we do? Well, we can make the bottom into a 4x if we just multiply by 4 over 4. So remember, this is an expression, meaning there is no equal sign. You can only uh, multiply something that is equal to a 1, which in this case is uh, 4 over 4, which is a 1. 
So if we do that, we are going to get limit as x goes to 0 of 4 times sine 4x over 4x. Now, if we apply the limit rule, the limit rule says we can take out any constant and put it in front of the limit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take just the 4 to the front and leave this part because that part is very nice to me. Sine nx over nx, right? That was one of the ones that we just talked about at the beginning. So if we have a sine something x over the same number of x, we can apply the limit uh, rule for a sine and uh, it will help us solve it easier. So I'm going to take this 4 out. And then limit as x goes to 0 of sine 4x over 4x. According to my limit rule, it tells me limit as x goes to 0 of nx over sine nx or sine, x, sine nx over nx is equal to 1. So then I can just say this part is just 1. So this is 4 times 1, which means it's 4. So the limit is 4. Okay, so let's go ahead and have you re pause the video really quickly and try number two. All right, hopefully you found this one to be very easy. The answer is one third. Okay, let's try uh, number three. This one is slightly harder, but not too bad. So let's look at this one. So in order to cancel the sine three x on the bottom and make sure that you're looking at the limit it is x goes to zero so in order to get rid of that sign three x then i better have a three x in the in the numerator correct so i don't have a three x i have a four x so what i'm gonna need is a three so what i'm gonna do is multiply by three Okay, if you can take a shortcut, like you can see what's going to happen, then, you know, go ahead and take a shortcut. If you cannot see a shortcut, then uh, I'm going to show you the long way right now. So this is basically 4 times 3x over 3 sine 3x, correct? Then what we're going to do is see that this 3x over sine 3x, this is what I want. So I'm going to keep it inside the limit. And then that 4 over 3 is... Um, Con uh, sorry, coefficient that I don't need, but I can take it outside of the limit. So that's what I'm going to do. Take the 4 over 3 out. Limit as x goes to 0 of 3x over sine 3x. And then again, that part goes to 1. So this is 4 over 3. All right. Let's go ahead and try one that is a little bit harder. Let's try this one limit as x goes to 0 of tangent x over 4x tangent x what am I going to do with tangent x well let's try to remember your you know all your trick stuff tangent x is sine over cosine so we're going to do the same thing except we're going to remember it's sine over cosine so it, this tangent becomes sine over cosine and then we're everything is over 4x right Hopefully by now you can just kind of move this um, fraction with the bottom fraction together so then you don't have to rewrite it even one more time. So this really becomes sine x over 4x cosine x like this. So what you can see is, again, how do you get rid of this? Well, remember the key is to get rid of sine. So sine only has one x and you can get rid of that x at the same time. Uh, that 4, I can probably move it to the front. That is a coefficient or 1 fourth as a coefficient. This cosine x, I don't know what to do. So, but let's just kind of fix what we can. So 1 fourth limit as x goes to 0 of, I'm going to write it separately so we can see this more clearly, sine x over x times 1 over cosine x, right? This is kind of the bro broken up form of this. Okay, we know this part goes to 1. What about this part? Okay, I'm going to do this really slowly, but eventually I think you guys can do this really quickly. Limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over x times limit as 
x goes to 0 of 1 over cosine x. So we have two limits multiplied by each other. This goes to 1, we already know that. What about this part? Well, if you pl plug in 0, what's going to happen? Cosine 0 is what? Cosine 0 is 1. So this is actually, if you pl plug in 0, you're going to get 1 over cosine 0. Cosine 0 being 1 means this is 1. So don't assume it's always going to be undefined. It is actually not undefined. So then the answer is actually 1 fourth. So be careful, a lot of people kind of see this limit with some kind of uh, trig function. They always assume it's undefined, but it's actually not. So cosine is not undefined uh, at uh, zero, uh, even in the denominator. So uh, be careful on that. All right, let me just show you a few weird ones and then, um, and then you can probably do some on your own. All right, what about this case? It's kind of weird. Hopefully we don't make any more algebra mix mistakes at this level of calculus. Uh, you don't go like this and then kind of get a five minus three. So that's not a good idea in any kind of math. So please be careful. So what should we do in this case? I'm gonna give you a hint, common denominator. So what I can do is split this fraction like so. Right? And then, so, I'm sorry, this is kind of confusing. So it's actually, they're all inside the limit. And remember, limit of some thing is really the same as saying limit being kind of, in a sense, distributed. So then you can actually do this. All right, so go ahead and pause the video and try to finish this problem. All right, the answer is actually two, <laughs> guess what? Uh, so bad math actually sometimes get you the right answer, but don't do it anyways. <laughs> um, okay, so let's try this one, number six, this one. So think about what you're going to do. There is a tangent cubed on this. So try to apply what we just talked about with um, tangent. So go ahead and pause the video, try this problem and um, come back. All right, go ahead and check your answer. If you really didn't know what to do, so here you have the sine cubed 2x, which means you need three sine 2x's three sine two x's, which means you need that on the in the numerator as well. We have an x cubed, but we don't have a two cubed, which is why I multiply by two cubed top and bottom. And so when we do that, we can cancel that out. And we have this part left over, which is not undefined at x equals zero. So then you just plug it in and then you get a one eighth. All right, let's try something that is a lot more obscure. Um, this one, what should we do? Well, the problem is this here. If you plug in zero right now, you are going to get zero times one over one minus one. One minus one is going to be a zero. So it ends up being zero over zero, which is um, indeterminate form. So we cannot do that. But hopefully you do remember something from pre-calc. This one minus cosine x is interestingly familiar because we could multiply by one plus cosine x. And then we have an a plus b times a minus b situation. So then, um, let me just write this out. So sine squared x times cosine x times one plus cosine x over one minus b, sorry, <laughs> one minus cosine times one plus cosine is one minus cosine, whoops, squared. What is one minus cosine squared? That is sine squared. So sine squared x times cosine x times one plus cosine x over sine squared x, because we know that's what it is. 
this cancels. We have only cosine left over. And again, cosine is not undefined at x equals 0. So that's nice. Plug 0 in. If you plug 0 in, you get 1 here. If you plug it 0 in, you get 1 here. So 1 times 1 plus 1 is 2. All right. Let's have you try one last one, and we are done for today. Okay, did you get the answer? This one is a little more complicated because you need to take this, do this trick that I just showed you, and then change that into a sine square of 2x. And sine square of 2x means you need 2 2x in the denominator, which you don't. You only have 1x, which means you need a 2 square and another x. And then so when you do that, eventually you can cancel out the sine squared 2x with the 2x quantity squared in the denominator. And then at that time, you can plug in um, x equals 0, which you have a 0 in the numerator. So you end up with a 0 over 2, which is just um, 0.